Thank you all so much for coming out on a dreary evening to uh, hear about a dreary topic and to the organizers for bringing me out to Madison. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to talk to you all about my work and uh, hear about the activism that's going on here in town. So I think the best way to, for me to start is to explain a little bit about how I got involved in these issues. Um, I was working as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune and covering breaking news and kind of shootings and dead bodies and city council meetings and things like that. And it was leaving me feeling really dark and depressed. I mean, it was not the type of work I wanted to be doing. It's not what I entered journalism hoping to do. I mean, at the end of the day, I didn't feel like I had any positive impact, um, you know, that I contributed in any meaningful way. And so I decided to go out leafleting with a group of activists. And in college, I had a background in animal rights activism, environmental activism with groups like Earth First, uh, protests against the World Trade Organization. And I thought that as a journalist working on a newspaper, that's really the most I could do would be to pass out leaflets. And of course, we were arrested, my first and only time I've been arrested. Uh, and those charges were later thrown out because it's still legal to pass out leaflets. But the important part of that story is that I was visited by two FBI agents a couple weeks later. And this was only a few months after September 11th. And they told me that unless I helped them by becoming an informant and investigating animal rights and environmental groups, that I would be put on a domestic terrorist list. And at the time, I was really shocked and ashamed by how afraid that experience made me. I mean, at the time in um, the movements I was a part of, the idea of showing fear was just not acceptable. So, I mean, I kind of had this idea in my head that if I had experienced any FBI visit or something like that, you know, you just kind of throw up two middle fingers and walk off into the sunset and wouldn't be phased by any of it. But it really did scare me. I mean, it, I had no idea what that meant after September 11th. But after that fear kind of subsided, and I never thought for a moment about becoming an informant, I really became obsessed with finding out how the animal rights and environmental movements became the number one domestic terrorism threat, according to the FBI. And there's not any official listing of terrorism threats, but that rhetoric permeates all levels of government now. And so when the FBI on their website lists Osama bin Laden alongside Daniel Andreas San Diego, an animal rights activist, it sends a very clear message to the public about its priorities. But before going any further, I think we need to talk a little bit about who is not being labeled the number one domestic terrorism threat. And that includes people like Joe Stacks, who in my home state of Texas, who flew a plane into a government IRS building in protest of federal tax policies. Includes the Huttery Militia, and there's been a widespread rise in militia groups across the country in the last few years. The Huttery Militia, as you can see, they're very proud about being armed. They consider themselves a, a Christian holy war organization. And of course, you can't talk about right-wing violence or uh, special interest group violence in this country without talking about anti-abortion extremists who have a history of murdering doctors, murdering nurses, all in the name of depriving women of the right to control how they choose their own health. If there's one example that you would think people across the political spectrum in government would identify as domestic terrorism, it would be the person who was involved in the single most deadly act of domestic terrorism in US history prior to 9-11 of the Oklahoma City bombing. In my research, I found that people like the former Homeland Security Director in Pennsylvania, James Powers, consistently identify Timothy McVeigh as, quote, not a terrorist, just very angry with the US government. So there are other people who are very angry with the US government as well but don't have anywhere of that history of violence or bloodshed. And I'm sure most of the people in this room are you're somewhat familiar with these uh, social movements or sympathetic to them, but these movements, like every social movement throughout history, has a variety of elements. I mean, there are people that leaflet and write letters, people who lobby members of Congress, people who make phone calls and do letters to the editor, people who protest, and then people who go a little bit further, people who do civil disobedience, Groups like Earth First who blockade roads to protest and stop physically the destruction of old growth forests. The Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and activists who put their lives on the line 
by physically putting their bodies between the whalers' harpoons and the whales in the Southern Ocean. There's been a rise in grassroots environmental organizing in the last few years, particularly around fracking and around the protest of the Keystone Pipeline. This was a protest in Italy that I think is a great example of how um, people can merge between all these different areas of activism. This was a lawful above ground protest, but as people were gathered at this animal testing facility, they were really emboldened by their numbers, by the thousands of people that were there. And spontaneously, some people started climbing over the razor wire fences and going in to the facility and taking out some of the dogs that were being used for animal testing and then lifting the puppies back over the razor wire fences. So it's clearly not a lawful protest. I mean, they knew they were breaking the law, but they were doing it publicly. Police were right there. But it is different than illegal underground actions by groups like the Animal Liberation Front or Earth Liberation Front. And crimes by these groups, are, I think, were really at a high in the 1990s, and since then have tapered off quite a bit, or at least the claiming of responsibility for crimes in the name of these movements has tapered off. This was a particularly iconic image of the var, uh, the, excuse me, the varson. That means arson at Vail, <laughs> Vail Ski Resort in uh, Colorado, in protest of the resort's expansion into the last habitat of an endangered lynx. So, in all of these tactics, you know, from the leafleting to the most extreme of using arson to destroy SUVs or empty buildings. No human being has ever been injured, and that's according to the FBI, and it's something that in the history of social movements, I emphasize because it's incredibly rare. In movements throughout US and world history, the civil rights movement, anti-apartheid movement, there's always been a wide range of elements, and almost all of them, in fact, all of them besides these movements that I can find, have had elements of physical violence as well. According to the government, or excuse me, this was a, a report according to uh, West Point, the military academy, which isn't exactly a you know, holdout of leftist, vegan, anarchist, radical thinking, right? Um, but they did a, the most exhaustive study of right-wing violence, and they showed a 400% increase since the 1990s. And some of the concerns that I'm going to raise this evening have also been raised by bipartisan congressional reports. This one was uh, from last year, Into Domestic Terrorism. It talks about my work extensively, references the book, and calls for congressional hearings into why the FBI is focusing on nonviolent activists, urges lawmakers to consider an overhaul of the legislation that I'm going to be talking about. But the FBI has consistently ignored those questions. So to me, it raises a bigger question of how did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where people who have never harmed anyone are the top terrorism threat, and people who have killed hundreds or are part of social movements that have killed dozens, if not hundreds, are not? And to answer that question, I began turning to other periods of government repression throughout US history. And the most notorious of those, of course, I think is the Red Scare of the 20s and also the 40s and 50s in the US where people were persecuted and demonized for being communists and dissidents. And in my work, I'm not arguing tonight that what's going on today is the same as what happened then, because it's not. I mean, there are some really important differences. But I think the similarities are enough to warrant an examination to help us understand the mechanisms of what's taking place today. And in fact, I'll go even a little bit further and say the tactics that we're seeing today are parallel not only to the Red Scare, but to many, many other eras throughout US and world history where people are being singled out and persecuted because of their ideology. So that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit this evening. It, you know, as we're examining you know, how activism is criminalized, I want to present what I think is literally the step-by-step -step process in which this operated against these activists. And the most important step in every era is to use the power of language. Now, we all know, you know, during the Red Scare, it was Joseph McCarthy standing up with his list of names, right, of suspected communists. But with this issue, it was a bit different climate, because at the time, in the 1980s, 
the animal rights and environmental movements were growing very quickly and very boldly. They had widespread public support, even for the more militant or radical tactics. We're getting support in the Los Angeles Times as environmental warriors. Meanwhile, you had national groups like PETA who were publicly supporting illegal underground actions by groups like the Animal Liberation Front. This is a newsletter from their archives, um, in which you can see they have a feature story on why, who's doing it and why about the Animal Liberation Front, a feature on Britches, a primate that was rescued by the ALF. Um, Britches had his eyes sewn shut and was used in really horrific uh, sight and maternal deprivation experiments. And the ALF broke into this lab, stole him, took him to a sanctuary, and then released the footage to PETA, who kind of acted as a, a media spokesperson on this issue. Now, these movements, I mean, by having this widespread public support and also being unified within the movement, represented a real threat to the businesses and special interests they were targeting. And so, in response to that, these groups realized they had to change the debate. They had to change the nature of the discussion so that these people were no longer environmental warriors or monkey wrenchers, as Ed Abbey would say, or saboteurs, or even a straightforward criminal, which is frankly accurate in a lot of these cases. They made up a new word of eco-terrorist. In 1985, a special interest group at one of these think tanks just made it up. And over the next 20 to 30 years, they used that language relentlessly in media campaigns to help change how we talk about these concepts. So here's, I think, a good example of how this works. If activists are arrested, the government immediately sends out press releases labeling them as terrorists. The press has overwhelmingly adopted this language, I would argue, without any critical reflection. I mean, I think the press has really dropped the ball in a lot of ways and contributed to this advancement by having headlines before someone even sets foot in a courtroom in which they're being labeled as a terrorist. I mean, you know, the most powerful language that we have right now, shaping public perception of them before they even have a trial. At the same time, these corporations are taking out advertisements and paying for media to change how we think about these issues. This is an example from the mid-1980s from the fur industry. Meet the world's newest terrorist. Don't tolerate terrorism in America. Fur is for life. Now, 20 years from this image to this one, and the, the imagery and the iconography is all exactly the same, and this kind of black masked figure um, this one is referring to activists holding Wall Street hostage, not through guns or bombs or actually holding hostages, but through effectively protesting so much that they got the multinational corporation delisted from the stock exchange. And as you can see, you know, the imagery evolved a little bit, but they still really haven't done their research as these animal rights activists have their leather jackets. <laughs> And any time this opportunity arises in pop culture, they seize on it. So I think this is one of my favorite examples of a kid's movie called Hoot, in which you know it's the classic archetypes of kids like animals. And when kids find out that animals are being abused, they do things to try to help the animals. In this case, they do things like tip over porta potties and sabotage bulldozers. And the industry groups, when they found out about this, sent out press releases warning parents that don't take your kids to go see this movie, because if you do, they may come home wanting to be vegetarians, and it's soft-core eco-terrorists. But the press picked up on this, and so you saw all these articles around the country, should you take your kids to go see Hoot? This was a full-page ad in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today that is so convoluted you actually need a flow chart in an attempt to connect the Humane Society to terrorism. And you can't see all the details, but what they're arguing is that a vice president at the Humane Society went to a holiday party of a group called the Humane League. The Humane League had members who were once affiliated with another group called Hugs for Puppies. Hugs for Puppies had members that were once affiliated with another group called Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty. 
Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty Philadelphia was affiliated with Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty, the national group. And six members of that national group were indicted on conspiracy to commit animal enterprise terrorism and were sentenced to between one and six years in prison. So obviously, the Humane Society is the exact same as a terrorist organization. This is my all time, you know, in all the years I've been doing this work, I've never found a better image that starts to reflect the true nature of the animal rights threat in which we see that they've taught lobsters to crawl on land, they've taught owls to carry dynamite, um, and the most damaging, of course, is that none of the women shave their legs. Um, but the men do. But so as all this kind of absurdity is going on, it's not just a media spectacle, it's a political spectacle also. These special interest groups are also pushing for congressional hearings. And I testified before one of these, um, not this one, uh, about the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And the way it works is, you know, I initially viewed it as an honor, no matter how much I know that it wasn't going to be. But I thought, you know, maybe I get to talk about my work. You know, how many journalists get to do that? This is great. You know, I'm, I'm trying to shape the dialogue here in Washington, right? Um, and you get there. Or even before I got there, I was told by the members of the committee, the Democrats on the committee, that it's okay to raise minor objections, but it has bipartisan support. And of course, I've raised major objections. So I think this will be the last congressional hearing I ever testified before. But the way it works is, you know, somebody like me as the, the token opposition, and then Pfizer, or excuse me, GlaxoSmithKline, the FBI, the Department of Justice, and you have people like Inhofe that say, well, thank you all for coming here today. We're here to evaluate whether eco-terrorism is the number one domestic terrorism threat. And we're going to hear from all these experts, including GlaxoSmithKline and the FBI and Department of Justice, and then you know, this other guy, whoever the token gesture of opposition is. And then at the end of it, thank you all so much for coming. It's clear that eco-terrorism is the number one domestic terrorism threat. Do you see how this works here? And then there's press releases, there's media campaigns, there's interviews about this, and it all enters the congressional record. So it lends a legitimacy to ideas that were just created on the fringes and manufactured. And as all that's taking place, there are these campaigns to divide these social movements. And not to get too nerdy talking about this, but I think it's useful thinking of these movements existing both horizontally and vertically. So horizontally, I would argue that the animal rights and environmental movements exist alongside other social movements. You know, there's a lot of differences and they don't see eye to eye and there's kind of a natural tension both because of the beliefs of these movements and how we interact with other social movements. But I think generally speaking, they exist alongside civil rights groups, um, you know, struggles for gay and lesbian equality, struggles for um, you know, just across the political spectrum, anti-war groups, uh, anarchist groups, all kind of loosely moving in the same direction, right? And the messages from politicians and corporations is consistently that these movements are not part of the capital L left. They're not real progressives. They're not like the rest of you. These are extremists. They're different than anyone else. They want to make sure you can't... Um, you know, take your kids to the circus anymore. You can't eat what you want to eat. You can't wear what you want to wear. These environmentalists want to make sure that we don't have the power we need for our cars and our way of life. They're trying to completely undermine what it means to be an American. I mean, that's how boldly it's put. Meanwhile, these movements have vertical elements. So you have above ground groups like Humane Society, PETA, Sierra Club, you have groups that are kind of in the middle. I mean, I would say somebody like Earth First. They sometimes break the law. They're sometimes clandestine. And then you have illegal underground groups, like the Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front. And there's natural tensions between them also. I mean, there's fierce debates about what tactics are appropriate. Now, some politicians have seized on this, especially the post-9-11 climate, and actually sent out letters 
to the national organizations and told them that unless you publicly condemn the radicals, not just their tactics, but what they believe, that you're going to be investigated as terrorists as well. So the result of that, I mean, when you have social movements that are fragmented horizontally and they're fragmented vertically, you have people that are isolated. And when you have people that are isolated, this type of repression can continue much more quickly and forcefully. Now, in the last few months, I think we've all become aware of how pervasive government surveillance has become in terms of the, just the scope of information that's being vacuumed up by the NSA or FBI. But I don't think most people understand the more covert methods that are taking place alongside that. Uh, here's an example that's from the UK that I think is just a great illustration of this, of tactics that are used here in the US as well. This is an undercover cop named Mark Kennedy or Mark Stone, who spent years of his life infiltrating environmental groups and protest groups. All the while, you know, despite his uh, tattoo and do-rag and uh, wraparound bandana or shades and the earring, goatee, ponytail, really, you know, the real anarchist starter kit here, um, he's also Mark the Cop. And as he was also Mark the Cop, he was even having sexual relationships with activists um, who had no idea of his true identity. I mean, kind of giving you an idea of the scope of what we're talking about. And he was traveling internationally. I just was speaking events in Germany in which he registered to attend, I find out years in hindsight. He was working with international law enforcement in Europol. We even found, through the Freedom of Information Act, evidence of surveillance about my work, which is, according to government even, purely First Amendment activity. They have the counterterrorism unit had information about my speaking events like this one, media interviews, what I write on my website, um, and stuff about the book. And one of the sections, the reason I included this is that they refer to the book as compelling and well-written. So that's my, <laughs> uh, you know, if the counterterrorism unit thinks so, I hope you all will too. 1695, it's a real, Now, most activists never find themselves in a courtroom. But those who do, it's been really important that they're sentenced disproportionately. So here's an example of how that plays out in real life. This is Marie Mason. She was involved in a couple of uh, crimes targeting genetic engineering research in the name of the Earth Liberation Front. She was caught, sentenced to prison as a terrorist. She admitted her responsibility, was sentenced to 22 years in prison as a terrorist. She's now in FCI Carswell in a special prison unit um, because of that. This guy on the right went out on the election night of President Barack Obama with a group of friends, and they had sticks and pipes and batons, and they went around beating African Americans who they suspected of voting for the first black president. They even ran over someone with, excuse me, with their car, who they thought was black, turns out he wasn't, and put him in a coma. Now, for that type of politically motivated violence in the name of their beliefs, they got between four and a half and nine years in prison. They were not labeled as a terrorist. Uh, Marie, like I said, has 22 years for destroying some university research and some crops. Now, it's not just that kind of sabotage that's being targeted, though. Everyone here know Tim to Christopher? Does the name sound familiar? Kind of, sort of. Tim, as a University of Utah student, found out about an oil and gas leaks auction in which public lands were being auctioned off to corporations. And there have been campaigns going on for years in Utah to stop this that hadn't been successful. And Tim went there, and he wasn't intending to do anything, but he says in hindsight that he saw how emotionally affected his friends were by seeing these lands being auctioned off to be destroyed, that he decided to raise his own bidder's paddle every time the lands came up. And he knew he didn't have any money. I mean, I'm sure like almost everyone in this room, either as a student or um, you know, whatever you do, he didn't have the money to buy these massive amounts of land, but he kept doing it anyway. And they kept raising the price and he kept raising his paddle until he racked up 
quite a bit that he owed. And he knew he had no intention of doing this. It was purely an act of civil disobedience against what he saw as an unjust practice. And I should point out, a federal court later agreed and said this auction was illegal. So in other words, Tim disrupted an illegal auction nonviolently, and he was sentenced to two years in prison. And after that happened, you had state politicians make statements like this one that what he did was no different than burning down a cattle operation. It was eco-terrorism. They actually introduced new legislation trying to label what he did as a specific new terrorism crime. Not long ago, we got some new documents that showed that when it comes to court cases, you even have corporations like TransCanada giving PowerPoint presentations like this one to a room full of law enforcement, in which they have you know, dossiers on friends of mine here, and they're instructing the police how to prosecute them and urging terrorism prosecutions as well. So does that make sense? The corporations are literally sitting in front of the room of people like you all telling the police who to prosecute and how in order to protect their interests. Now, as I said, most people never end up in court. But for those who have, it's been absolutely essential that the government has either snitches or informants. Now, if you're not familiar with the federal court system, it's really what I would call a snitch model of law enforcement in that most people who go to, um, who have a federal case, over 90% of them end in favor of the U.S. government. And prosecutors make this known if you're ever pulled in for questioning or if you face charges, that if you take this to trial, you have the full weight of the U.S. government coming down upon you, and you, the odds are completely against you that you're going to win this. So it puts pressure on people to provide information, even if it's true or not, to try to get themselves a deal. And that's the model that's at work here, is they pull in people, they strike this fear into them, they get them to strike a deal um, in the hopes of providing more information than it goes on from there. What's also become prevalent in law enforcement, though, is using informants not just to gather information, but I would argue to actually manufacture these plots. This was a pretty high-profile case in which this young woman named Anna um, wanted to become an FBI agent. She was a student also. And that she got on the FBI payroll and she was traveling the country with a group of activists. She was providing them with food and housing, hotel uh, costs when they needed it going from protest to protest, and all the while she was trying to get them to blow up a dam. She even had the materials that were financed by the FBI, and of course she was on the FBI's payroll. As this was taking place, these activists though had no interest in doing that, and later on in court, um, there were some recordings in which she was really, really frustrated with them, and she was yelling at them, are you guys going to get serious? Do you actually want to do this, or do you just want to sit around and smoke pot and talk politics all day? Which, I mean, if, give her the choice, right? <laughs> so obviously they chose the latter. You know, we'd rather smoke pot and talk politics. Um, and she was really frustrated by this. And eventually the FBI pulled the plug and said, you know, this is done. Long story short, one of the activists, after the, a couple of the others uh, turned on him through that snitch model, Eric McDavid was sentenced to over 20 years in prison, not for doing any of these things. He didn't blow up anything. He didn't plot to blow up anything. He was a com confused, <clears throat> accused of conspiring to do so, and he was convicted for that. And his conspiracy was not rebuking this federal agent forcefully enough. After 9-11, there were millions and millions of dollars available to fight terrorism that were flowing down from the federal government, and still are, to the states. And everyone wants a pot, piece of that pot, right? They want to qualify for that funding. So to do so, there's been the rise of an entire industry of counterterrorism co corporations that help evaluate terrorism threats. And a funny thing happens when you pay private corporations tens of thousands of dollars to identify terrorism threats. 
they identify a lot of terrorism threats. In this report, this one's one among many in Pennsylvania that uh, led to a big state scandal. The counterterrorism company identified animal rights groups who were protesting the use of horses, uh, environmentalists who were holding film screenings of the movie Gasland, uh, Dominican nuns, I mean, the list goes on and on. The important part of this that I think you all need to understand, though, is that this information, no matter how bad it is, is circulated through law enforcement agencies, and it kind of bubbles itself up to law enforcement branches. Does that make sense? So it's being contracted out. When the information comes in, it's used to support these grants and applications and things like that, and it's treated as fact, and then law enforcement actions are shaped around that. One of the most dangerous new elements of this is the passage of new laws specifically targeting people because of their politics. The law that I mentioned testifying against is called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And I mean, I could do the entire lecture on, on that law and I'm happy to answer questions about it, but the most important thing I think to know is that it's written around the concept of causing a loss of profits to animal enterprises. It's not about violence. It's about economic damage in the language of the legislation. And it's so broad that it could wrap up according to the sentencing in the law, nonviolent civil disobedience as a crime of terrorism. Now, in my, in my research against, about this law, I came across an internal website of the groups who were lobbying for it that someone had sent to me. And being the good you know, investigative journalist I am, I entered a, a username of test and a password of test, right? And the whole thing opened up. <laughs> and that's the only reason that we know who was behind some of this legislation. GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Wyeth, Covance, the Animal Ag Alliance, the Beef Council, Ringling Brothers, Fur Commission, um, biotech groups, the pet industry, Society of Toxicology, I mean, the list goes on. But I mean, it also involved universities. The University of California system supported this legislation. All of this behind the scenes. Now, when I testified about that law, the concerns I raised were about First Amendment activity and about things like undercover investigations. And the members of the committee were very forceful in saying, Mr. Potter, you have no idea what you're talking about. It would never be used in this way. This is about arson. Do you support arson? How dare you, you know, conflate these things? Well, come to find out, that was a complete and total lie, and that the FBI has considered terrorism prosecutions under the previous version of this law for nonviolent undercover investigators. By that term, I mean people who are just taking photographs and videos of what happens on factory farms. And an expansion of that now, states around the country have introduced what are called ag-gag laws. Ag is agriculture, and gag is obviously to silence. And the first wave of these bills were specifically targeting photographs. That was it. It's because these investigations have led to the largest meat recall in US history. And I would argue though, what's even more important is that they have really changed the national dialogue in just a couple of years about all of these issues. I mean, when the footage comes out, you have industry groups defending it or denying it, but most often just defending it, and saying things like, body slamming piglets to death is humane, pork experts say. Now, the general public doesn't buy that, and we've seen it overwhelmingly. I think these undercover videos have really completely changed the nature of the discussion about animal welfare, animal rights, about going vegetarian or vegan. You have you know, Al Gore went vegan recently, Bill Clinton, Ellen DeGeneres. It's like this discussion in a, in a much higher profile and popular or pop way than was being uh, than what was happening before. And an extension of that is something that we've, or I hope you all have been seeing in uh, the university system here for quite some time. It's not just about agriculture, but these kinds of tactics are being used about animal experimentation as well. So the UW system has tried to, and successfully passed, new legislation that exempts researchers from animal cruelty. That was in 2011. And then a more recent example is they attempted to pass a new law um, that limited open records requests regarding animal experimentation. 
Now, the obvious intention of that is to keep images like this from becoming part of the public dialogue. The animal rights group PETA was engaged in a legal battle for years to get these photos, and they just recently obtained them. And now they're on a couple of buses in the area. I haven't seen one since I've been in town, but I don't know, maybe some of you have. But I mean, it's pretty, can you all see that okay? It looks kind of washed out. But if you, for some reason you can't, it's a cat with an electrode in his head um, planted into his brain. And I think the effect of images like this is parallel to the effect of images about factory farming and slaughterhouses. I think people may have a theoretical idea of what lab tests are, what animal experimentation is, what factory farms are, but it's much different to see it and to, to viscerally feel it. Now, if there's one defining characteristic that I think throughout US and world history that we attribute to some of the most dark periods where governments have clearly gone too far is the creation of special prison units for people because of their politics. Now, most people know about Guantanamo, but there are two prison units here on US soil called communications management units that are used to house people that, according to the government, um, are there because of their political beliefs. This is Daniel McGowan, a friend of mine who was convicted of his involvement in Earth Liberation Front arsons. I was able to visit Daniel as a friend, not as a journalist, because no journalists are allowed in these places. Communications management units radically restrict prisoner communications with the outside world to levels that meet or even exceed some of the most extreme facilities in the country. Um, as an example, when I visited Daniel, you walk into the prison and the entire rest of the prison is on lockdown. So every other prisoner there except the CMU prisoners. That's how seriously they view this security threat. Daniel is already in a, a small room as I march down, you know, a series of corridors and police checks and security checks. Um, they make sure I don't have a pen and paper. They tell me that if I ask him anything that sounds like an interview question, that not only will I be pun punished for this, but he will as well. And then we have a meeting in a room, you know, I could touch both, granted I have very long arms, but <laughs> I can touch both, our, both walls there. Um, we're between bulletproof class, live monitored by the counterterrorism unit. There's like this little bubble in the ceiling. And Daniel's not allowed to shake my hand. When his wife visits, he wasn't able to hug her. He wasn't able to hold his niece. I mean, all these things that go against a body of research by the Bureau of Prisons itself about the humane ways of treating people who are incarcerated. I guess a handful of uh, visitation a month is released now, but he's engaged in a lawsuit challenging these facilities because we've come to find out that, according to the government, they are for, quote, prisoners with inspirational significance, inspirational to the social movement's of which they're part. Now, I would argue that that phrase, inspirational significance, is clearly a euphemism for political prisoner and that these are political prisons, singling out people either because of their politics, in Daniel's case, or in that of Andy Stepanian, an animal rights activist, or singling people out because of their race and religion. Over 90% of the people that are in these CMUs are Muslim. Um, According to some of the, according to Daniel and others, the guards would refer to the activists who are there as balancers, because these white kids would hopefully balance out the clearly discriminatory practices if they were to face a legal challenge. Now, of course, I lied, and there's this unspoken final step that always exists to this process, and that's to start the whole thing over again. And we've seen that quite a bit, especially after the rise of the Occupy movement, in which the federal government just freaked out about anarchist organizing as they saw the anarchist influence on Occupy and, and decentralized methods of coordinating. This was from a presentation by the FBI to new FBI agents that, you know, there's kind of the boilerplate protest photos and stuff like that, but what's really disturbing is that anarchists are described as criminals seeking an ideology to justify their activities. Now think about that for a moment. I mean, we're talking about an entire political school of thought 
that's existed for a couple hundred years, right, in various forms, if not formally. I've uh, been involved in every major social movement globally. But that's just criminals, and they're searching out an ideology. In other words, it's criminalizing an entire belief system before people have even done anything. These tactics are also spreading internationally, and that's become something I'm a lot more interested in in the last year or so. As I've seen how Europol has identified photos and videos by animal rights groups as one of the most ter significant terrorism threats facing all of Europe. I recently did a speaking tour in Australia and New Zealand and come to find out that the ag industry in Australia is modeling new laws on the US ag gag laws. And they're saying this, they're actually saying in the press, well, the US ag industry has new laws making it illegal to take photographs and video of factory farms. We want these same US laws. Totally logical, right? The logic though behind it is that, I mean, corporations have no national boundaries. So as they and these industries spread internationally and as they coordinate, um, you know, through neoliberalism and global capitalism, they have no restrictions on that trade. We have restrictions on how we move, but corporations don't. So they're able to take these tactics with them and share them across countries. Now, of course, this is the inevitable question, right? Thank you for all this horribly depressing information on this really rainy day. Now I want to go home and watch, you know, every season of Breaking Bad back to back and never leave the house. Well, that's not the message I'm here to leave you all with tonight, because I think there's a lot we can learn from this, especially with these ag-gag fights in recent years, has made me really start to rethink a lot about the, the potential that exists for moving these issues forward. There's a case of a young woman named Amy Meyer who took photographs of a slaughterhouse from the public street in Utah, and she was arrested and prosecuted as the first person ever to be prosecuted under these ag-gag laws. And I found out about it and wrote about it, and it led to a lot of media attention. And just 40, 24 hours later, the prosecutor's office dropped all charges and said they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And to me, that was a really important lesson in that not only is the industry terrified of public exposure to the abuse of animals, but the government and corporations are also terrified about public exposure to how those tactics are being repressed. With both of those elements, we have a very powerful weapon through public education. I gave a speaking event at um, Georgetown recently, and at the event, there was a coalition of groups that I've never seen before working together on these issues. I mean, you have me sitting next to the ACLU, the um, ASPCA, which is the most mainstream animal protection group probably in the world. Um, in the audience, you had representatives from like the Sierra Club, Teamsters, workers' rights groups. Now, all of these groups have a lot of differences, but they're starting to see parallels in their work and specifically how people are being criminalized. I think there's an enormous amount of potential there. And although it's really disturbing to think about how this type of activism, simply taking photographs, can be criminalized, I think it's important to think of it in this narrative that I've put forward of where this all started. The common theme through all of these movements and all these groups, whether it's underground actions or whether it's the Humane Society doing an investigation, is that they've been incredibly effective. They've been effective at changing the public discourse about these issues. They've been effective at challenging corporate profits. They've been effective about taking small groups of people with very little money, very little resources, and challenging some of the most powerful interest groups in the world. And to me, that's inspiring. I think really is a roadmap and a, a, a signal of the potential that we all have to get active on whatever issues we're involved in. Now, I include this image because it always makes me smile to see folks that I support also supporting the work that I'm doing. But more importantly, I think it's really representative of the spirit in which I'm here with you all tonight. I don't view this information as static. I mean, this is not a history text. 
This is stuff that's going on right now, and there are people in this room who are active on all these issues. And so that's how I view my work as well. I mean, these are really identifying these steps so that we can use them to better inform our own activism and our own organizing and how we're interacting with members of Congress or our community. And so we can take these tools, whether you're in the Southern Ocean or in Madison or in Washington, it doesn't matter, and use them to shape how we're thinking about what we're doing. You know, in my work, I turn a lot to other eras of government repression, in part because I'm always looking for answers. You know, I've kind of picked a very uh, niche <laughs> area of focus that's not the most uplifting in the world to, to focus on government repression, these type of tactics. And so I'm constantly looking to, to history to try to learn elements of what people did right, how to move forward. And one era I keep turning back to is there's a group uh, called the White Rose during you know, the real peak of the Third Reich. And it was a student group with Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans and a few others. And they traveled the country with leaflets that they printed in their home and distributed them um, in universities. And ultimately they were caught and beheaded. And even at the end, Sophie Scholl in particular show no remorse for this. I mean, she made these incredible statements about um, how she made no apologies for distributing these leaflets and she would suffer the consequences. She wouldn't beg for mercy or anything like that. So of course, I mean, it's a pretty incredible story that I turn to not only for their courage, but also constantly asking myself, like, why would you pass out leaflets in a period of history that seems so completely dark? You know, I don't know about you all, but if I, I can't imagine what living in that period would be like, but I don't know if passing out leaflets would be my first uh, order of response. I mean, I think we'd all like to think you'd do something more extreme or more direct. But in reading a lot of what Sophie Scholl wrote, I came to realize that her motivation was really an unwavering faith in the power of education and the radical transform transformative powers of the truth. And I found this passage that I thought that was really uh, telling about what we're talking about tonight that I just wanted to read for you all. She says, the real damage is done by those millions who want to survive. The honest men who just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weaknesses, those who don't like to make waves or enemies, those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principles are only literature, those who live small, mate small, die small. It's the reductionist approach to life. If you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you. But it's all an illusion because they die too, those people who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe from what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues, and a little candle burns itself out just like a flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. I think the theme between all of these things that we're talking about this evening and all these eras that I've referenced is how fear is being manipulated, whether it's the fear of September 11th, fear of a foreign enemy, fear to make people complicit and terrified of speaking out and being active. I mean, that's really at the core of every one of these steps is to make you all afraid of being active on the issues that you care about and to make the people who are not in this room afraid of being associated with you or for speaking out themselves. What Sophie Scholl and the White Rose really represent to me is how important it is to not lose sight of the potential of the people who are not here. That they can see this information, they can learn from it, and that they can be part of this as well. They can be part of movements and organizations like this. They can be part of these communities. It's easy to become so incredibly jaded about all the things I'm talking about. And believe me, you know, living in DC, like, I'm over it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much longer I could even just tolerate working in that town, right? But I think it's really important that if we, even if we lose faith in 
politicians and certainly in corporations and um, you know, local leaders, what have you. That's fine. Lose faith in the church or in universities and political systems, fine. But you can't lose faith in the power of the people who are not in this room with us tonight or the people that are sitting next to you. I think that's really the spirit in which Sophie Scholl was speaking, and that's certainly the spirit in which I'm here this evening. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for having me, and I look forward to having questions and discussion. Thank you all so much for coming out on a dreary evening to uh, hear about a dreary topic and to the organizers for bringing me out to Madison. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to talk to you all about my work and uh, hear about the activism that's going on here in town. So I think the best way to, for me to start is to explain a little bit about how I got involved in these issues. Um, I was working as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune and covering breaking news and kind of shootings and dead bodies and city council meetings and things like that. And it was leaving me feeling really dark and depressed. I mean, it was not the type of work I wanted to be doing. It's not what I entered journalism hoping to do. I mean, at the end of the day, I didn't feel like I had any positive impact, um, you know, that I contributed in any meaningful way. And so I decided to go out leafleting with a group of activists. And in college, I had a background in animal rights activism, environmental activism with groups like Earth First, uh, protests against the World Trade Organization. And I thought that as a journalist working on a newspaper, that's really the most I could do, would be to pass out leaflets. And of course we were arrested, my first and the only time I've been arrested. Uh, and those charges were later thrown out because it's still legal to pass out leaflets. But the important part of that story is that I was visited by two FBI agents a couple weeks later. And this was only a few months after September 11th, and they told me that unless I helped them by becoming an informant and investigating animal rights and environmental groups, that I would be put on a domestic terrorist list. And at the time, I was really shocked and ashamed by how afraid that experience made me. I mean, at the time in um, the movements I was a part of, the idea of showing fear was just not acceptable. So, I mean, I kind of had this idea in my head that if I had experienced any FBI visitor or something like that, you know, you just kind of throw up two middle fingers and walk off into the sunset and wouldn't be phased by any of it. But it really did scare me. I mean, it, I had no idea what that meant after September 11th. But after that fear kind of subsided, and I never thought for a moment about becoming an informant, I really became obsessed with finding out how the animal rights and environmental movements became the number one domestic terrorism threat, according to the FBI. And there's not any official listing of terrorism threats, but that rhetoric permeates all levels of government now. And so when the FBI on their website lists Osama bin Laden alongside Daniel Andreas San Diego, an animal rights activist, it sends a very clear message to the public about its priorities. But before going any further, I think we need to talk a little bit about who is not being labeled the number one domestic terrorism threat. And that includes people like Joe Stacks, who in my home state of Texas, who flew a plane into a government IRS building in protest of federal tax policies. It includes the Huttery Militia, and there's been a widespread rise in militia groups across the country in the last few years. The Huttery Militia, as you can see, they're very proud about being armed. They consider themselves a, a Christian holy war organization. And of course, you can't talk about right-wing violence or uh, special interest group violence in this country without talking about anti-abortion extremists who have a history of murdering doctors, murdering nurses, all in the name of depriving women of the right to control how they choose their own health. If there's one example that you would think people across the political spectrum in government would identify as domestic terrorism. It would be the person who was involved in the single most deadly act of domestic terrorism in US history prior to 9-11 of the Oklahoma City bombing. In my research, I found that people like the former Homeland Security Director in Pennsylvania, James Powers, consistently identify Timothy McVeigh as, quote, not a terrorist, 
just very angry with the U.S. government. So there are other people who are very angry with the U.S. government as well, but don't have anywhere of that history of violence or bloodshed. And I'm sure most of the people in this room are somewhat familiar with these uh, social movements or sympathetic to them, but these movements, like every social movement throughout history, has a variety of elements. I mean, there are people that leaflet and write letters, people who lobby members of Congress, people who make phone calls and do letters to the editor, people who protest, and then people who go a little bit further, people who do civil disobedience, groups like Earth First who blockade roads to protest and stop physically the destruction of old growth forests, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and activists who put their lives on the line by physically putting their bodies between the whalers, harpoons, and the whales in the Southern Ocean. There's been a rise in grassroots environmental organizing in the last few years, particularly around fracking and around the protest of the Keystone Pipeline. This was a protest in Italy that I think is a great example of how um, people can merge between all these different areas of activism. This was a lawful above ground protest but as people were gathered at this animal testing facility, they were really emboldened by their numbers, by the thousands of people that were there. And spontaneously, some people started climbing over the razor wire fences and going in to the facility and taking out some of the dogs that were being used for animal testing. And then lifting the puppies back over the razor wire fences. So it's clearly not a lawful protest. I mean, they knew they were breaking the law, but they were doing it publicly police were right there. But it is different than illegal underground actions by groups like the Animal Liberation Front or Earth Liberation Front. And crimes by these groups are, I think, were really at a high in the 1990s, and since then have tapered off quite a bit, or at least the claiming of responsibility for crimes in the name of these movements has tapered off. This was a particularly iconic image of the, var uh, the excuse me, the Varson, that means arson at Vail, <laughs> Vail Ski Resort in uh, Colorado, in protest of the resort's expansion into the last habitat of an endangered lynx. So in all of these tactics, you know, from the leafleting to the most extreme of using arson to destroy SUVs or empty buildings, no human being has ever been injured. And that's according to the FBI, and it's something that in the history of social movements, I emphasize because it's incredibly rare. In movements throughout US and world history,